Hi everyone, it's Jerry. In the AI Grandmaster Chess Tournament, uh, round two, we had Victor Lesnica with the white pieces versus Wesley So. Let's have a look at their game. D4, knight f6, we have a, a Nimzo Indian. Bishop b4 indicates that. Queen c2, classical variation, watching over c3 and not allowing any uh, doubled c pawns. Black hassles a3, putting a question to this bishop, uh, pretty much forces black into making this bishop takes knight um, capture. You Pretty much, if you're playing the Nimzo Indian defense, if you're going to develop your bishop out like this, you do have to be prepared to uh, give it up for this c3 knight at some point. Um, because the alternatives aren't so bright. goes back to a4, gets trapped, and if it goes back to, let's say, e7, then white has a really nice pawn center. Um, so, without wasting any time, black captures the knight, and after the recapture, d6, you'll note that as a result of this imbalance in the position, as a result of um, this exchange for knight, knight and bishop, um, black is black no longer has the dark square bishop, and so it's going to start to make a bit more sense to place pawns on dark squares so that black can start to control uh, the dark squares. It'll work well with the remaining bishop. Um, so bishop to g5, the other feature of that d6 move is that it vacates d7, and black makes use of that. Connected knights will now allow black to eventually get out of this pin. Um, right now this uh, knight on f6 cannot, of course, move. And there's no need to try and rush things um, with moves like h6, bishop back, g5. Okay, yes, you get out of the pin, but you forever subject your king to potential um, uh, attack because of uh, weaknesses that you're creating with these pawn moves, h6 and g5. So just uh, natural developing moves are, are best at this point. Connect the knights, and eventually the queen will get off of this diagonal. e3, the king bishop's ready to come out. b6, the queen bishop. And now knight to e2. The knight from e2 is a bit more flexible than f3 in that it could maybe at some point make use of the c3 square where from that point it will have a whole host of uh, possibilities. And uh, this queen from c3 uh, really doesn't want to hang around there for too long. Eventually she's likely going to be having to react to uh, a knight landing on that e4 square once this pin um, once black is no longer in that pin. So c5, this is um, a couple things going on with that move. One, striking in the center. It's going to have to happen at some point. Black has to challenge this pawn center that white has on c4 and d4. Uh, but not only that, it vacates c7 for the queen. Rook d1. Um, this is an interesting move because you might be very tempted on the white end at this point to just think about, well, I want to get castled. And so I'm going to move my knight and then move my bishop. But that's not so easy because moving the knight to, let's say, g3, well, first and foremost, this knight on g3 isn't that well placed. In fact, uh, most action is likely going to be take, taking place along the c and d files, and this knight is just uh, too far away from the action. Uh, but not only that, this idea of just developing the light square bishop isn't going to be so easy uh, because of the pressure that uh, black has on that uh, g2 pawn. And so uh, what white is essentially doing with this rook to d1 move is making a very purposeful move and waiting and also waiting to see how black goes about uh, this current tension in the center. Um, it also from d1, this rook also from d1, is supporting a potential advance to this d5 square. So that's another feature of this rook to d1 move. Um, again, this knight um, don't be in too much of a hurry to just clear the way for your king bishop's development just so you can get castled. You do want to keep your pieces well placed at the same time. So rook to d1, queen, C uh, queen to c7, that's purposeful. Get it off the same file as the rook. And now queen to c2, you'll note that as a result of queen c7, black is no longer in a pin, and so knight to e4 is threatened. And that would uh, be winning material, hitting both the uh, queen and bishop, so white's not going to allow that. Queen c2 watches over e4, and you might question why not go to d3. It watches over e4 as well. What's the difference? Well, the queen really doesn't like to be a leader in some sort of battery along the d-file. Uh, but not only that, it's also within striking distance of this d7 knight. At some point, it could hop to c5 or e5 and give the queen a headache. So let's just back up to c2. 
Pawn takes pawn, knight recaptures, and now we have bishop to um, a6. Uh, why doesn't the bishop, why isn't the tension in the center maintained? Like, uh, is, isn't black helping white out by uh, releasing the tension between these two pawns? You know, I think I think this knight wants to ideally be placed on that d4 square. Um, why isn't bishop played here right away? Uh, the reason for that is queen a4, and then this bishop kind of looks silly. Uh, there's no convenient way to really um, meet this threat of just queen takes bishop. It kind of just backfires this move. So uh, capturing first on d4 and after the recapture now allows this bishop to a6 move come with a better effect, putting pressure on c4 because the move queen a4 is now nicely met with queen with uh, knight c5, not only attacking the queen but uh, protecting the bishop. So we have this counterattacking move coming into play. And then uh, eventually, actually, the knight could pivot on e4, hit this, hit this bishop, and uh, what's really happening? It's uh, the black pieces who are pressing forward, and white is the side who's having to retreat in a position where white has yet to complete their development. In fact, there's still two moves that uh, white needs to uh, complete their development, and oftentimes in a an open or semi-open position, you only need to be one move behind in order for uh, your position to collapse. So uh, white would most certainly be getting pushed around if queen a4 was played at this point right here. Um, so taking taking all of this into account, taking this idea of white being the side who's now underdeveloped, they need two moves before they're um, completed with their development, namely bishop out and then uh, white castles. Um, that That right there is what's prompting white to give up that dark square bishop with bishop takes knight. Because after the recapture, you'll note that queen a4 is now played with uh, great effect. Hitting this bishop, there's of course no counterattacking move in that of knight c5 at this point. Uh, and there isn't really a great way to really meet the, the pressure that white has against this bishop because what do you do exactly? If you move the bishop out of harm's way, that makes um, this move very, very strong. This, this pawn is going to be... Um, uh, on the sidelines very soon, uh, hitting hitting the queen and pawn. That's uh, black's in rough shape. So uh, black ends up going to c8. That is the best move because going to b7 will just run into moves like bishop e2, and then this is going to be a serious problem. There is of course no queen takes pawn because of bishop f3. Everything is protected, and uh, everything is uh, just going way downhill for the black side. So um, that's why we're seeing at this point queen to c8. So unfortunately, black is now the side who's having to underdevelop in a way because, you know, the queen from c2, you know, there was uh, a direct connection between these rooks. The rooks were connected, but now she's having to interfere with that and watch over this bishop. You know, she has to babysit that bishop, and that's not really a position you want to have your pieces in. So bishop to e2. Bishop b7 and now white castles. So just a, just a few moves ago, it was white who was two moves behind in development and black who was fully developed. And now it's it's uh, black who's needing to kind of make some more developing moves, namely getting this queen off of the back rank. So rook d8, lending support to that d6 pawn. That's uh, something that's going to be needed to, um, well, black has to take care of that pawn because it's uh, potentially vulnerable. It moves like knight to b5. So b4, expanding on the queen side, but not only that, looking to press forward yet again and stake claim to that c6 square, which is a hole in the black position. So a5 and now queen to b3. Uh, white wants to just be in a position to meet. Pawn takes pawn with um, a takes b. And so uh, that wouldn't be possible for as long as the queen is there, just making a nothing move. Uh, we have this attack on the queen. The queen would have to recapture and uh, this rook already has possibilities of maybe capturing it, uh, capturing not only the a pawn but maybe even making use of this a a5 square at some point and swinging over laterally. Um, the big thing here is to not allow this rook um, some sort of target along the a file. And white wants to be able to have a pawn on the b4 square um, so that it uh, could again press forward to b5, where it would then control c6. So. We don't have this silly little pawn move. We have the more purposeful, of course, queen to b3, getting out of that idea. And after capture, capture, we have d5. So 
Black is trying to get rid of uh, one of the liabilities in on the Black side, which is that d6 pawn, and uh, Black is successful with doing that. But again, if there's one downside, just well, just to name one downside, it's that this Black Queen is a bit misplaced, and White is trying to take advantage of that with their next move, Rook to c1, getting ready to just capture and then uh, grab that Queen. So Queen b8 eventually comes into play after uh, a recapture on c4. We have queen to b8 and now b5. There it is. The knight's ready to hop to that c6 square and cause uh, black serious problems. And that's pretty much what dooms black in this game is this c6 square. So initially, in the very beginning of the game, a lot of the attention with this Nimzo Indian defense focuses on um, this e4 square. But now the attention as uh, the game is progressing, and now the attention is turning towards this c6 square. So knight to e4, ready to land a fork on that d2 square. Queen c2 gets uh, watches over that square, hits the knight, and after knight to c5, we have that knight hopping into c6. So um, th there's a fork going on. This this has to be captured. This knight on c6 cannot be tolerated. So black has to hope to just try and. Uh, gobble up that c6 pawn, but uh, that's not so easy. In fact, um, this is a really strong move. Uh, bishop to e2, just getting ready to watch over this pawn from this f3 square. Now, another idea is, well, the bishop can also play to b5 and watch over that pawn, so why wasn't that move played? Both, both prepare to uh, do the same thing, watch over this pawn. But what are the differences, in other words, between having your bishop on b5 opposed to f3? Now, it takes two t two uh, moves before it could get on f3, and it would just take one to get to b5, so it seems a bit more purposeful to play to b5. But no, um, it's not as safe from the b5 square. You'll note that it's hanging, it's unprotected, and unprotected pieces leads to tactics. That's not to say that there is a tactic in the, in this position, but it's at least vulnerable to moves like rook to a5. And okay, yes, maybe you can watch over your pawn, watch over the bishop, but that's not a role you want to have your pieces playing where they're having to watch over one another. So the bishop is most certainly going to be better placed on this f3 square. And after bishop e2, there is no, there is none of this uh, queen takes pawn because of the skewer. So that's why we have at this point pawn to e5, and before black can play e4, this bishop gets on that diagonal, and now we have rook to, um, rook to d6, just preparing to double, putting more pressure on this pawn. Maybe, maybe there's thoughts of giving up um, the exchange just to get rid of this pawn, which is just a couple steps away from queening. That's a very, uh, very dangerous pawn to have to cope with. Uh, rook, to, rook to the d-file, uh, sensible move. That rook wasn't doing anything from f1. It's not really needed to watch over, let's say, f2. So let's get it involved. Exchange rooks, and now queen c4 is preparing to really make a nice, um, uh, a really nice move uh, coming up by white, uh, which is to say uh, this bishop move. Let's see, we have h3 first off, preparing a flight square for the king, and black does similar. And now this really neat move, bishop to d5. Not only hitting this pawn, but um, you know there there is no there is no rook takes bishop at this point because of the very strong c7 or the just the winning move at this point really. Um, if if queen takes pawn, then the rook is lost, and so too is the game most likely. Uh, I don't really see a well. At least black would be up in a, a very uphill battle if this variation came about. Uh, if rook check, we could just have um, king to h2, and we just have a bunch of things going on. The queen's hit, uh, the rook is captured, the queen is overloaded essentially. It has to watch over the pawn from queening and also this um, this rook right here, and that's uh, one job too many. So that's why we're not seeing rook takes bishop at this point, but instead king to um, king to g7. Uh, you could grab this pawn, but is that really worth it? No. Um, this pawn is most certainly more valuable than this pawn. So um, that's why we have e4. And now, how, what a great bishop this is, right? It's um, very well 
protected by this e4 pawn it's uh, supporting c6 everything's strung together and this knight although it's um, well protected um, it really can't go too far if it moves then this pawn is able to move forward so we have f5 and the black king is uh, in some serious trouble because of this queen move focusing on e5 there's not really a good way to go about defending that pawn uh, again the queen unfortunately has the role of having to watch over a, 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 a little pawn here, a one point piece from just queening. And so the queen really doesn't have time to watch over um, this pawn right here. Um, if she were to, let's say, play to e7, um, well, we could actually have f4. Uh, I should have pointed out that with this move, not only is the queen attacking an unprotected pawn, but it's also placing it in a pin, which is double trouble. So um, black goes about things by playing king to h6 of all things, and white has simply seen further. You know, they're able to actually go ahead and still pick off this pawn and work themselves into this fork. So, well, certainly some calculation was um, done here. The queen, rook being hit, the queen comes back to c3, and if knight takes rook, we could just have queen takes knight, the king is in check and you know what's coming up this pawn is going to get pushed and this queen is going to end up having to give itself up um, because let's say after the king moves c7 uh, the queen has to maybe play here and then bishop b7 uh, deflecting the queen away and now uh, we just have uh, the promotion so um, that's what would happen if knight takes rook in this position but we don't see that instead queen to g5 White just has to be a little bit accurate at this point, playing rook to c2, defends everything, gets out of any nonsense that might occur with uh, capturing on that c1 square at some point. Uh, but not only that, it watches over this e2 square, which is going to be very purposeful um, in just a couple more moves. We'll see exactly why. After pawn takes pawn, we have just white pushing forward, not caring about this bishop, of course. could be taken a couple ways, but white is threatening, of course, to queen. After knight to f4, mate is threatened, and after queen to g3, that's the ball game. The queen is uh, preventing the mate threat that uh, black had on g2, and you'll note that this rook from c2 will see the purpose. Uh, we see now the purpose of that rook lift to that c2 square. It's watching over a move like knight to e2, which would um, give a fork to the white side. Um, so that's all for this video. As always, I hope you're able to take something away from it. Take care. Bye.